Tonight, let's go to the book of Galatians in chapter 6, and I'll begin to read. Actually, I'm going to read tonight from verse 8, uh, Galatians in chapter uh, 6 and verse 8. And I just, I, I encourage you to get a good study Bible. If you, and people will invest, you know, $100, $200, $300 in a good pair of shoes because they want to, you know, make sure their feet have proper support. I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, investing in $100 or $200 in a good study Bible. But I've got some here that are excellent. I think the best around, and we buy them because we can get them a little bit cheaper for $43. Genuine leather, 40, 37 for bonded leather. But I'm telling you, find a good study Bible so that you can write in it. You can circle in it. You can mark it up. Uh, if you uh, don't mind marking it up, sometimes people don't like to do that. But bring a notebook and just uh, get into the word of the Lord. But look what it says here in Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. If you live according to your flesh, if you live according to your fallen nature, if you live according to your sinful nature, you are going to reap destruction corruption or we can say destruction that's what the bible says if that's how you're going to live if you're pampered to the flesh if you live for the flesh if you give into the flesh if you yield to the flesh the bible says there's the law of sowing and reaping that you're going to reap destruction let me tell you something it will happen because the word says it but he who sows to the spirit i love this will of the spirit reap everlasting life so when you invest into the things of the spirit in other words if you sow and to the spirit and you spend time in meditation and spend time in prayer and spend time in the presence of God, spend time meditating upon the word of the Lord and you make that your life and you build your life around the life of Christ and he is your life and he is your love and he is your Lord and you're sold out to God, then you're going to reap everlasting life. Let me tell you that folks, God is going to bless you. God is going to be with you. God is going to protect you. God's going to provide for you. God's going to defend you because you've given into the spirit. All right. You've, you've sold into the spirit and let us not grow weary while doing good amen that's the bible says for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart so in other words we're doing a good thing and i know it hadn't been always been easy but bible says to continue on if we will continue if we don't lose heart amen we shall reap in due season god god's going to help us through this amen then it says in verse 10 therefore as we have opportunity okay Come on, church. We have the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord tonight, don't we? We have the opportunity to be in the Word of God. We have the opportunity to worship the Lord. Therefore, as we have opportunity, and he says, let us do good to all. Amen. Amen. That, that's not that's just like a few, but to all people, to all people, let your light shine, especially, he says, to those who are of the household of faith. Now, who are those people? Those people are the saints of God. Those people are especially right here. Do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith, those like you and I, part of the body of Christ, part of this local fellowship established as the church of the living God. Amen. Tonight, I want to minister a little bit on the thought, don't give up and don't give in. Don't give up. You saw that on Facebook today. Don't give up and don't give in. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. I'm asking God for your unction. Give us hungry hearts, attentive ears uh, to hear of thy word. Minister to us, I pray. Minister, Lord, we want the Holy Spirit to have his way. You are welcome in this place. Speak through this vessel, Lord. I'm nothing without you and can do nothing apart heart from you. So Lord, I'm asking you, touch these lips of clay. I pray to bring, bring you honor. Lift up the name of Jesus. Bring you glory, Father. Fill me, Lord. Establish your people and your church and bring stability in each of our hearts. And I'll thank you for it as I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Don't give up and don't give in. It seems that in my observation, there just seems to be a lot of Christians, especially this month and last month, that love God, that are doing their best to serve God. God, but have become weary in the journey. Sometimes we become weary. Sometimes we become weary in the battle. I fully understand that's possible to grow well, to grow weary in well doing. It's possible that you're doing your best to serve God and yet you get tired. I know that in many years of ministry, there have been times I have been so tired and so weary. You can ask my wife and my kids. There are times I'm just so discouraged that I want to throw in the towel, that I want to quit. People not treat me right. I'm tired. Devil hit me. 
me all kinds of things. So tired I can hardly think or put one foot in front of the other. I mean tired physically and mentally and spiritually and emotionally. Yes, Christians can become weary. But Paul clearly encourages the saints of God in Galatia to not grow weary and well doing. Now Paul was trying to tell them now, look what happened to you. You started out right. Paul established churches there in Galatia, in the region of Galatia, and they had gotten saved by the grace of God through faith, and they were on the right track, doing the right thing. Then after Paul left, some Paul teachers came in behind him, began to tell the people, hey, amen, not only do you have to have Jesus, but you have to have the law of Moses, and you have to hold the law and all this kind of thing. Paul said, you started out right, but who bewitched you? How would you get off on the right track to the wrong track, and all that kind of thing? And so Paul was trying to encourage them. I mean, he had, he had, he had rebuked them. He had corrected them. I, I mean, some strong rebuke in that. But at the same time, I find that, that Paul was also trying to encourage them. And that really is a sign of a good minister or a good pastor. He might correct you. He might rebuke you. He might have to tell you some things to straighten up in some areas. But at the same time, he will encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. He'll encourage you and tell you that God loves you and God's got a purpose and a plan for your life. Well, Paul was encouraging the saints of God as well in Galatia. So this verse really indicates to us here in Galatians 6 and 9 that it's possible to grow weary. It's possible to become tired or worn out. It's possible that along the journey of faith to become lax, lackadaisical, or even passive. But I want to help you tonight to keep running that race that's set before you, saints. There is a prize ahead of us. There is a hell to shun, and there is a heaven to gain. This is not the end of it, but just the beginning, and somebody can shout now, hallelujah. This is beginning. Set your sights on heaven above, and God will help us. God will strengthen you. He'll be with you. Amen. So don't forget that. Hold on to God. There's nothing greater than knowing God, having a relationship with the Lord. I love it when people are hungry for God, that desire God, that really want to know the Lord. Mm, things that can cause a Christian to grow weary. I want to talk about that here tonight. I want to talk about some things that can cause you and I to grow weary. Number one will be this. It will be sin. It's a three-letter word, S-I-N. That's right. I know that this is not a topic that a lot of people like to talk about or deal with, but let's deal with it tonight because sin is not our friend, but it is our enemy. Such a small word but cause so much trouble. Sin will keep us out of heaven, and it will slow us down. Sin will keep us from obtaining all that God has for us. The world has a sin problem. America has a sin problem. Marrying has a sin problem. I can tell you this, church, the church of the living God even has a sin problem. Too many think too lightly of sin. This bothers me. This disturbs me. Because I'm finding today in this generation, in this time frame, and where we are today, that many are taking sin too lightly. But because of our sin, Jesus went to the cross and he shed his blood. He gave his life for the remission of sins. Man, my friend, that is love. He took upon himself human flesh, the word personified, and suffered and endured mockings for us. That's how much he loves us. He suffered, he bled, he died. That's how much he loves you. He came to seek and to save the lost, to give us life and life more abundantly. And he did this because he loves us. Amen. Hallelujah. And I pray that we love him the way he loves us and we love others the way he loves us as well, like I talked about this morning. But sin in our lives will cause us to grow weary. It will wear you down. Now listen to me. Uh, Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Let us lay aside every weight and, uh, help me out here, the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Okay, so here we go. This verse immediately indicates to us that sin can and will easily ensnare us. The idea there of snare or ensnare means to catch or to trap or to entangle uh, sin will not only slow you down, but it'll trip you up. Have you ever try, tried to run uh, with your shoes tied together? Do you remember uh, when you were in grade school or something like that, and one of your friends slipped by, tied your shoes together, and you didn't know it, and you got up out of your seat, you went to walk, and you tripped up? That's the idea of this word right here. Amen? I, I remember, you know, it'll slow us down and hinder us from competing in the race. The thing uh, is a lot of people think too lightly of this. They think it's not such a big deal. They think that God will just wink at sin. It really doesn't matter. I'll ask for forgiveness later. But we don't realize the harm and the damage it's causing us a 
and others, blinding the eyes and the hearts of many people. And it will slow us down in the race that God has before us. I don't make it up. The Bible says it, my beloved friends. You know, I've shared this story before, but when I was in junior high, I was on a track team in Ventura, California, and uh, I, I was running the 440-yard dash with a, a team of about three other people. There were four of us all together. And I was the last one to run in that race. And I was the one that would be crossing the finish line. And I remember when they were coming, man, I was getting nervous. My hands were getting sweaty. And I was, well, I tell you what, I was, I was nervous as they were getting closer to me. And I decided if I'm going to run faster and I don't want anything to slow me down, I decided to take off my shoes and to take off my socks. Back then it was a grass track in California, very nice. So I took off my shoes. I didn't want anything weighing me down. I didn't want to get tripped up. I didn't want anything slowing me down. And so I gave it all that I had. I was running so fast. My legs were in front of my body. And I was trying to catch up with my legs. If you know what I mean. I wish I could run like that today. But I can't run. But we can run like that in the spirit of the Lord. Amen. And I just want you to know. We won that race. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. The coach come to me and said, Mark. He said, why didn't you tell me you can run so fast? I said, coach, you never, you never asked. Amen. But he knew it then. Oh, my beloved of eyes. A pastor can look out at you as the church of living God. God and see that sister running or see that brother running oh rather than just sitting on the bench and not being prepared and not working out and not getting in shape oh if I can see you running if I can see you run how that must bring joy to our God and our Savior amen amen I look out about tonight and I say are you running are you running are you running my friend oh Lord God the truth is no willful sin in our lives will cause us to grow weary watching things we shouldn't watch and listening to things we shouldn't listen to. I've seen it happen. You know, neglect can cause us to grow weary. Spiritual carelessness can cause us to grow weary. I wish this place was packed out tonight. I said, I wish this place was packed out tonight. Get your running shoes and let's come to the house of God and let's worship the Lord. Sin is a big heavy burden on our shoulders. Have you ever tried to run a race by carrying somebody on your back or on your shoulders at the same time? It's kind of hard. Have you ever tried to run a race wearing heavy boots? It's kind of hard. What will happen to you if you do? You'll get tired really fast. The next thing you know, you've quit. You give up. You're too tired. You're too exhausted. You're too weary. I, I notice these people that do these triathlons. And, and uh, you know, uh, Matthew, I've seen you. And Mimi, I've seen you do whatever those things are. And Izzy, you know, Michael, they, get, they go together. And I don't know what that thing's called, but it's some kind of race that they do. And they get all muddy and they go through this and all this obstacle course. And I don't know, last for half the day or something like that. But I'm telling you, before that time time comes those kids are training they're training they're in the gym and they're training and they're getting the right kind of shoes and the right kind of clothing on them and all that kind of thing getting ready for that big event they don't just show up unprepared no they are ready to run that race amen and we need to be running ready to run the race that God has hallelujah I mean if they went there with big heavy clothes and big heavy jeans and big heavy boots I guarantee you they'd probably knock out of that thing about halfway through give up say there's no way to get too tired and too weary Oh, my beloved, I pray that we would put on by the Spirit of God and by faith the Word of God and run the race that God has set before us. The wonderful Word of God is saying that if we happen to have known sin in our lives, then let it go. Get rid of it. It's not helping you. It's hurting you. It'll cause you to miss the blessings of God. It'll cause you to miss the purpose and calling of God in your life. It'll cause, it will cause you to want to give up or to give in. But if you will confess your sins to God. The Bible said He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. God will free you up. You will feel like a new... When I got saved, that's what happened to me. I mean, the heavy load and the guilt and the shame and the burden of sin. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Do I have a witness to... I mean, lift it up off of me. I'm a new person. I felt different. Praise God. And I feel good today. I thank God that He washes. He will free you up. Amen. Man, the heavy weight and burden and guilt of sin will be gone. And then you can run freely with full speed the race that's set before you. The second thing I want to talk about that will slow us down or cause us to grow weary will be unbelief. Number two is unbelief. Hebrews 3 and 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you... 
an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So this verse indicates several things. Number one, under this verse, and it said, first of all, he is speaking to Christians. He is addressing those who are saved, those that are born again. Number two, he gives us a clear warning. Beware, watch out, take heed. The word of God is full of warnings. Why would God warn us? Amen. Because he doesn't want us to be entrapped or ensnared by the tricks of the devil. Amen. Number three, we can have a or and or develop an evil heart. Christians can develop an evil heart. I've seen it. I've witnessed those who at one time they come to this church and at one time they had a right heart, they had a right attitude, everything was good. But later they begin to develop an evil heart of unbelief as they would drift and fall away from God. You say, Pastor, why did that happen? I'll tell you why. Because although the Word of God was taught and preached, they did not apply it and they did not obey it and therefore their heart became hardened. I've seen it happen so many times and, and their heart is so hardened and I would try, I would try to tell them and I'd try to talk to them and I'd try to share with them what's going on and and, and they wouldn't believe. They're just angry and mad and they resent everything of God. And then they start resenting everything in the church and all the ministries in the church and all the people in the church. You tell me how that can happen. Where they were so excited about the Lord, on fire for God, loving the word of the Lord, loving what God is doing, and loving and being a part of the things of God. Until now, they've drifted away to the way had nothing to do with it. I'll tell you what happened. It was an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief came into their heart. Number four, it's possible that we can be saved and we can lose our way with God. I've witnessed those at one time were saved. Listen, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They used to testify in the church, baptize, speak in tongues. But I've seen them and they fell away from God. It was their own choice. And now listen to me. They're not serving God. They're not in fellowship. They're not in church anywhere. And they're back in sin. They're back living for themselves. And they're not serving God. They're not in fellowship. They're not living for the Lord God. I pray that I'll bring back the backslider. Bring them back. Save them. Get them right before it's too late. In other words, they allowed unbelief to creep into their hearts. And it's caused them to grow weary. This was a warning to the Jews who had become Christians not to go back to the old Mosaic law of worship. They were tempted to go back, but, but the author of this great book gave them a warning not to go back. Keep moving forward. Keep believing God. That's in Hebrews, that is. And we become partakers of Christ. That is, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The children of Israel didn't believe God by faith, and they wandered in in the wilderness for 40 years they died out in the wilderness they never entered the promised land they never entered the spiritual rest God had for them why is that because of this my beloved listen to your pastor because of the sin of unbelief see we want to make sure that we keep our hearts broken before the Lord we're nothing amen we're nothing without God unbelief will cause us to miss the blessings of God he has so much for us and if we ever get a hold of how much God loves us us and, and what God has for us, then we would never be attracted to go back to the things of the world that the world has to offer. That world has no life. There's no power. There's no joy. There's no peace in that world. It's all an imitation, but it's not the real thing. God will give you joy. God will give you peace and a love and a strength and a power. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. It's supernatural. It comes from God and having a relationship with the Lord. Oh, I pray that we'd only want him. The Bible tells us for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So by reading about Israel in the Old Testament, we can learn by their mistakes so we don't make the same mistake. Don't allow unbelief to creep into our hearts because it will cause you and I to grow weary. The third thing tonight is spiritual attacks. Spiritual attacks. As a child of God, we will face times of opposition. Does anybody know what I mean tonight? Paul tells us in Ephesians, and we're 
were studying this in the men's Bible study in 6 and 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, which means that in the spirit realm, in the spirit realm, there is spiritual activity and there are demonic forces that come against you. I believe these are the last of the last days. There has always been spiritual attacks and spiritual warfare that have come against the child of God. But we also know that the devil will make war with the saints. The Bible says that in Revelation, we cannot deny that there are the realities of the powers of darkness. There are the rulers of the darkness of this age. There are spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And I can promise you that they will do and do target those who are saved. And especially those who are doing something for God. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to prepare you. The devil hates you because the devil hates God. The devil can't get directly to God. So he tries to get to God through you. Because you were made in the image of God. You belong to God. Jesus died for you. And the devil knows that God loves you. So the devil tries to attack God's people. I've seen and known ministers under great attack. We at this church have been under great attack at times. Your pastor has been under great physical attack at times. The Bible shows us very clearly in the Old Testament and the New Testament that there is spiritual warfare. We can take a quick glance at Job for a moment tonight. A man who shunned evil. Job was a good guy. I'd like to have him in my church. A man who prayed. A man who loved God. A man man who was faithful, a man that lived holy, a man that lived righteously, a man who feared the Lord, and yet he endured incomprehensible attacks from Satan. He lost all that he had. If that wasn't bad enough, then the devil attacked his health. And maybe some of you are there right now. I mean, you're doing your best that you know how. You love the Lord. You know that God loves you. You're just trying to be faithful and obedient to God. You're trying to raise your family right, trying to raise your kids right, trying to do right. You, I mean, you treat others right. You try. Maybe other people are mean to you, but you're not mean back to them. You're not retaliating the same way they are. But it just seems that you can't catch your breath. Does anybody know what I mean tonight? I mean, you just can't catch your breath. It's one thing after another, one attack after another. The devil is attacking your thoughts. He's attacking your mind. He's attacking your faith. He's attacking your health. He's attacking your family. He's attacking your kids. He's attacking your finances. He's attacking your ministry. He's attacking your church. And sometimes you get tired. And you become weary. You feel like giving up. The devil has his plots and plans and schemes and methods, but the devil is not in control. I know that God is. And that's why Paul said, let us not grow weary while doing good. Stay on the right track. Live holy. Live righteously. Do what you know is right. Do the right thing as a Christian. God will speak to you. The Holy Ghost lives inside of you. God will tell you what you need to do. Do the right thing. For he says in due season there's coming a time we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In other words, God is going to bless you. God is going to reward you. God is going to help you. God is going to bring you through Hallelujah. That's what he is saying. That God's got something for you if you don't give up on the other side. Job could have given up. Job could have thrown in the towel. But thank God that he didn't. He didn't have the New Testament. This is before the cross. He hung on. And sometimes we hang on. Boy, I tell you, we hang on by a thread, don't we? I mean, anybody know? I can tell you the Lord has it all together. God has got this. I've been in the middle of persecution and the fire, and I wondered where God was. I couldn't sense his presence. I'd pray and get no answer from the Lord. Cry out to God. I'd have a beg and plead with the Lord and get nothing from God. Amen. I mean, during testing time, the teacher is silent. Shh. It's testing time. Amen. But Job, he hung on. Oh, the Lord has it all together. 
Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives. I, I've resolved to trust Him no matter what. That's what that means. I've resolved to trust God no matter what. Whether I make it or not, I'm going to trust Him. Whether the devil takes my life or not, I'm going to trust Him. My beloved, don't give in and don't give up. Don't give up the fight. It's a good fight of faith. Don't grow weary. When's the last time you were flogged? What's the last time you were beaten? What's the last time you were thrown in jail? When's the last time that your hands and feet were pierced? We think we've got it bad. I make that little preacher out of him. <laughs> but when's the last time? My beloved, I know it's hard. I realize that. But they had it hard back in the New Testament times as well. They had it hard then too. Hey, listen to me. Don't give up. Listen, listen look at this. There's a crown of life waiting for you. We just got to get through this part of the journey before we enter into the next part. But one day we shall see Jesus face to face. One day this will all pass. Pass. Us. Amen. And we'll be in the very presence of God. You know, I love the story. And I want to preach it again. I just love Love this, but when the enemy came, we find that Shama stood his ground. There's only a couple verses about Shama. Shama, the, he was sick and tired of the enemy coming and stealing and robbing him. His food, his lentils, his livelihood, his groceries. You know, it's not like they can go to Kroger or, or Myers or or Walmart back then, you know. It's not like that. They had to grow their crop and that they had to save it up. That was their food for the year. I mean, but he was sick and tired of the enemy running over him. And this time when the enemy was coming, everybody else left. But Shammah stood his ground. He didn't budge. He stayed. And this time he said, I'm going to hold on to God. Everybody else ran away, but not Shammah. And the Bible said that God wrought him a great victory. Beloved, Hold your ground. Hold your ground. You're not taking my husband, my wife, my kids, my family, my church, my ministry, my city. I will hold my ground. Hallelujah. And this church through the years, whether through hell or high water, you have held your ground. And 20 years, we're still here. We're still here. Woo. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Still here. I know it makes the devil mad, but... Some have quit and given up. <laughs> I've had friends turn to become enemies. I've had people I thought would never, never turn against me, turn against me. And lie about us. And say things that are wicked and ungodly and hurtful. You've had it too. Even maybe family members. But you hold on to God. We might not see it now. We might, we might, we might not. But if you hold on to God, He'll give you a great victory. Number four. Number four. What can hold us back? What can hold us down? Look in the wrong direction. Of Psalm 121.1. Says, I'll lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Sometimes we grow weary because we're looking down instead of looking up. In other words, we have our eyes on the circumstances instead of on God. I'm guilty of this too. God is the source of our help. He's the source of our strength. My help comes from the Lord. See, the object of our faith must be God, not our circumstances. You know, Peter did well walking on water until he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to look at the wind and the, and the waves and the storm around him. And then he began to sink when he doubted. It's when he looked at all this he began to sink. And when we sink, we'll sink every time when we look at the circumstances instead of looking at the one that's bigger than the circumstances. Yes, the wind looks scary. Yes, the waves look like they're going to overtake us at times. Yes, it's real and can become difficult and overpowering at times. But we serve one that's greater than the wind and one that's greater than the waves. And his name is Jesus. When the disciples were afraid in the middle of the boat because there was a storm, Jesus said, peace be still. And suddenly there was an instant calm. We might be in the middle of a storm, but God can speak in your storm and there can be an instant calm in the middle of a raging storm. God can bring us peace and comfort in our hearts while riding out the waves i mean i i i saw a news clip and i i don't know it was like a 60 foot wave 
I don't know if it was in Hawaii or what. I just saw this recently. I saw it, a 60-foot wave. And you got that guy on that surfboard, and he's going down as fast as he can. He's got a little fish tail on that surfboard. And here comes this huge, humongous wave, and it came crashing on top of him. Can you imagine a 60-foot wave just come crashing on him? I said, God, that's how it feels sometimes. Just like how it feels sometimes. He went underwater, and he turned and turned and turned and turned and turned. He was underwater for a long time, but after a little while, all of a sudden, Poop, his head popped up. He's all right. Hallelujah. Amen. I can just see a big old 60-foot wave. The devil sends your way. Looks like it's going to overtake you. I'm not going to make it. Comes crashing over you. You come turning and turning and turning and turning. And the devil says, I've got him now. I've got him now. But after a little while, all of a sudden, poop, your head pops up. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Oh, you might try to knock him down, but you can't keep him down. Amen. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. You guys want to preach? Yeah. Matthew, come preach for me. Is he want to preach? Anybody want to preach over here? <laughs> Hold and will. Amen. Anybody over here want to preach? Amen. I want to come over here and shout for a little while. <laughs> Somebody got to preach so I can shout with the preacher. Amen. Hallelujah. Preach it, preacher. Amen. You don't look like you know much, but you're saying something tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I want somebody to preach so I can so I can shout with you. Amen. Amen. Get excited with this. Amen. Thought she had you down. Oh, poof, your head popped up. The devil just shake his head. Amen. Every time. Every time. Amen. <laughs> Peace in the middle of the storm. The question is, which way are you looking? Are you looking up? Are you looking down? The psalmist said, I'll lift my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? I'll make a conscience and deliberate choice. I choose to look up. I choose to look to God because he's my help and my help and my strength and my power and my victory come from the Lord. That's what he is saying. Amen. Amen. When that devil gives you a hard time, you look up. You look up. Notice the next verse there, Psalm 121. Notice it says, he will not allow your foot to move, to be moved. See, God will hold you in place. God will hold you. We've got to have traction. We've got to have stability. See, there's stability in God. And the more you know and the more you learn and the more that your faith is strengthened, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That's why it's important that you're here tonight because this is going in your heart and this is going in your soul and this is going in your spirit. And this gives you traction and this gives you stability. So when the devil comes around, he can't knock you around. He can't knock you around. There's no power that's bigger than God. Oh, Hallelujah. By having our eyes on the wrong thing or looking at the wrong direction can cause us to grow weary. It has for me. You know, at the same time, by having our eyes fixed on Jesus, not only will he give us strength and comfort to continue the journey, but the Bible says looking unto the author, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If we have our eyes on the Lord by faith, it will be continual strength. God will strengthen you continually. God will strengthen you. The fifth thing here tonight will be not praying. So there's sin, unbelief, spiritual attacks, looking in the wrong direction. Number five, by not praying. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, that men ought always to pray and not lose heart or not faint. So when I don't pray, I lose out. When I don't pray, I lose my spiritual vitality. When I don't pray, I find myself becoming weak. Does anybody know what I'm talking about tonight? Have you, ever, have you ever left the altar where you just didn't spend much time in prayer? Doesn't it make a difference? It makes a difference in your demeanor, your attitude. It makes a difference in how you treat one another. It makes a difference as to whether you want the Word of God or not or whether you want to worship the Lord or not. Amen. Prayer, prayer is the important thing, my beloved. It is important. The one thing the flesh will fight you the most will be in prayer. The flesh doesn't like to pray. The flesh doesn't like to bend the knee. But I find that if we want spiritual vigor and vitality... If we desire the power of God in our lives, if we want to rise above and experience more of what God has for us, then we must get back to old-fashioned, heartfelt praying. Get back to prayer. Elijah prayed, and his life made an impact. Just one man, but what a difference he made.
made. The Bible says the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The word fervent there means this, passionate. So it means passionate prayer or having or showing great emotion. That's the idea of fervent or hot or glowing. So it's not this unfeeling kind of prayer. Lord, I lay my da- myself down to sleep. Bless me. Thank you. God bless. Amen. That's not it. I'm, I'm finding that there are too many that have this no feeling in their praying. There, there's, no, there's no passion. There, there's no uh, great emotion. But the Bible tells me here that Elisha was a man that had great a passion and, and emotion in his praying. That he felt it. That God heard him. God answered. You know, the Bible says the early church prayed and the heavens were moved. Jesus rose up early in the morning to spend time with the Father in prayer. He always found a quiet place to spend time with God. Oh, a lot of good Christians are growing tired and weary because we've forgotten about the importance of prayer. Let me encourage you to get back to it. Find that prayer closet. It'll bring fresh oxygen to your spiritual lungs. Talk with Jesus and it'll make such a difference in your life. You will once again begin to sense the presence of the Lord. You will begin to hear his voice and instead of just making it, you will feel a strength and power in your life once again. Hallelujah. Have you ever leaned on your arm a certain way, your leg, and it went to sleep? You ever done that? And so you get up and your your arm's like, you can't feel it, right? It's just numb. And and that's what I think a lot, as far as spirituality in the modern age of the church today, I feel like that's what's happening. It's like their arm has fallen asleep. It's like their leg has fallen asleep and they can't feel anything anymore. And so what I do is I I have to shake it around and I've got to get the circulation going in my arm. Amen. Until I can finally move it and feel it again. We've got to shake this thing up. Glory to God. Do it by prayer. Do it by seeking the face of God. We need revival. God, turn this thing all over, upside down if need be. Whatever you've got to do to get us back to you, Lord. Amen. I, I, the other day, was, I don't know, it was yesterday, it was last night. It was last night. I was sitting in my chair at home last night after getting home from the church. And, and uh, I was actually studying some more. And, and I, I, I guess I, I sat in such a way. I'm 55. I don't know how I did, did this. But I actually sat with my legs tucked up underneath me. And I was sitting on my legs. You ever done that before? <laughs> I'm, you know what I'm talking about? I'm sitting. I, don't know, I can't even do it now, but I was doing it then. <laughs> and, and so I didn't know it. But... but I had, I guess I was pinching a nerve in, in my left leg and it had fallen asleep. And so I got up out of my chair and I went to walk and that thing just went dead. So I started, I, was, I, was, I had to stop because I wasn't going to make it. I had to wait until the thing woke up. And what I'm saying here today is the church is crippled and it's not walking properly. And this is how the church is walking right now. Because it's got one leg that's living and one leg that's numb. Spiritually numb. They can't sense or feel anything. Can't see anything. Can't hear anything. Now listen, folks. This is a Pentecostal church. Your pastor's Pentecostal through and through. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the gifts of God. I can sense the presence of the Lord. I can sense the power of God. I believe in the freedom to worship God and to lift up your hands and to pray. Hallelujah. Amen. You can pray quietly if you want to. But I, I, I'm a little bit more exuberant in prayer. Praying. Amen. Praying, worship, and praising. I don't do it just when you're here. I do it when you're not here. When I come in here by myself, I was doing it tonight before service, before everybody else showed up. I'm praising Him and worshiping Him and glorifying Him. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 But I pray that our arms and legs will no longer be asleep. Uh huh. Amen. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall run and not grow weary. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to get Abby on that thing one day and tell her put it in the organ mode. I'm going to run and not grow weary. (laughs) 
Wake us, wake up some of us. Amen. <laughs> I like that. I hear some of them preachers and that guy's on that organ. That preacher preaching that organ going, that preacher preaching that organ going, that preacher and people all over the place worshiping God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We need some more soul in here, folks. Hallelujah. <laughs> the four, the sixth thing tonight, busyness or activism. Amen. Always wears us down. Always on the go. Not any time for the Lord. Even our religious things can become just busyness. Busy, busy, busy. Rush, rush, rush. Go, go, go. Sometimes we can exhaust ourselves on everything but God. We exhaust ourselves on the things that are important to us but not to God. We find that in the Bible that Mary took the time and to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his word. The presence of God was there. Jesus was there. Everything else can wait. Don't, do you believe that Jesus was here this morning? Do you, I do too. Do you believe that Jesus would come back tonight? Jesus was there. Jesus was there. Mary wanted to be near the Lord. She wanted to listen to his word. But Martha was worried and troubled about many things. How many does that fit today? Hey, man, I can relate. Speaks to me too. But folks, Jesus is in the house. Don't we get it? He is the word. And I'm telling you, God, I feel and sense his presence. The cookies can wait. The dishes can wait. Food is important. But the spiritual food that Mary was feasting on was made way more of a priority on her list. Hold the burger and fries. Jesus is in the house. Don't you love it after we had a great powerful service? I mean powerful service on a Sunday morning. Amen. And you're still caught up in the presence of the Lord. And you're just, you're just basking in the presence and soaking it all in. And, and one of your family members turns to you and says, where are we going to go eat? <laughs> huh? Are you kidding me? Wait a minute. I'm going to say this spiritually. Get out of my face. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Oh, I don't want to make you all mad at me tonight, but I, 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 I tell you, I, 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 I know, I know, pastor and his kids, they, his kids sitting there, and they felt like he was going too long. They, they do this to him. They'd say, time's up, wrap it up, close it out. Yeah. yeah. I'm thankful that my kids never did that. I'm thankful. <laughs> that my kids never did that. At least if they respected me, they did it in front of me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my wife and I saw that. We saw that. Oh, my beloved. Isn't it interesting that when we have the genuine presence of the Lord in the service, people usually don't want to leave? At least for the most part, we've had services where we knew that God was in this place. Suddenly there's no longer thinking about the food, but now our hearts and thoughts are on Him. No one's in a hurry to leave. God's in this place. Sometimes we make our weekends, our Sundays so busy we have no time to think about the Lord. What, what about taking the Sundays and just, just worshiping God, just spending time in the presence of the Lord? Even schools have done this now to where now they take their, their, their teams or their, their whatever, that's volleyball or football or baseball or golf, whatever it is, gym or whatever. The other six days are not enough. Now they pull them out on Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings, they have practice at 9 o'clock in the morning on Sunday mornings. What are you telling our generation that they have to make a choice? They already, you already have them six days of the week, but now you're telling them that they cannot serve God, they cannot worship God. What would you do? What would you do? I know for us that are older, it might be a little bit easier to make that decision. But what would you do? What would you do? Hmm. I guess there has to be a decision. And the decision is this. Either, either you're going to say, I'm going to serve myself and I'm going to do this. Or, I, or you're going to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
You can serve the gods of the Amorites if you want to, like your forefathers did. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Breaks my heart. It's another, another trick that Satan uses to pull us out of God. I've seen it happen. I've seen new Christians get, get saved and love the Lord, and then Satan pulls them out either by a job or, or something else. He's always pulling them out, pulling them out. And we look at this in this life, we don't even see it. See, our leg is asleep and we're limping. We don't understand the importance of a soul. And we wonder why the church doesn't have the power, doesn't have the strength, stability, or stamina spiritually. Don't get mad at the messenger. I'm not preaching near as hard as I used to. You should have been here in the beginning days of this church. Burned up the carpet every Sunday. Had to replace it every week. Ask Sister Laura Lee. Ask Sister Alberta. Ask Sister Jan. Really? Brother Mike, you remember some of those days? I mean, it got pretty hot and heavy. I'm very compassionate now compared to what I used to be. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, church. Mr. Lord Lee said amen on that one. All right. <laughs> Number seven, what can cause us to grow weary, no more time for the word. Number eight, by not taking the time to be refilled. Not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. We talked about this here this morning, how important it is to be filled with God. That verse is written in Ephesians 5.18 in a present participle, which means it's a continual action we're being, we're filled, but then we're being filled and being filled and being filled. So there's the initial, there's the continual. I don't have time to go in all of this, uh, but it's so very important. If we don't take the time to be re refilled ourselves, then we won't be good to anybody. How can we pour into others if we're empty? How can we pour into others if there's nothing to pour? If you take an empty carton and you, uh, uh, and you pour, there's nothing coming out of it to pour into others. Every service, I, I, I know some people it's a job. I know that for some people it's just a career, but it's not that for me. It's a calling for me. It's a calling. And every service I prepare and prepare and prepare so that I might be able to pour into you, pour into you. Jesus poured into others. He poured into his disciples, and then they poured into others. And if we could be filled with God so that we might pour into others, be filled with his spirit. This here tonight is not a message of just do's, bunch of do's, but a message of hope that can help you to not grow weary in a time when it seems to be difficult for a lot of folks. We all need him. Jesus and God's word shows us how to have and maintain spiritual vitality through Jesus Christ. God has everything we need to live victoriously and powerfully as a Christian. God has it, and we have it through him. But I do believe, I do believe that there are people that maybe are weary and tired. But all let me tell you, if you'll come to Jesus, come to God, come to the Lord. For Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heaven laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I understand that this morning in Sunday school, you talked a little bit about the yoke. Amen. Amen. I want to be yoked with Jesus. How about you, church? Amen. Abby, would you come please tonight? I want to be yoked with the Lord. I want to be yoked with Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Another thing I, I don't, I didn't, I, another point I can just think about here is that um, to keep your spiritual vitality and strength is by remaining in God's will. Remaining in His will. It's when we get outside of God's will that we find ourselves getting very weary and very tired. But just stay in the will of God. No matter how hard it might be, God will give you the strength. God will give you the strength. Amen. God has strategically put us here for a reason. God's got us here for a reason. 
I have told my wife and I have talked about this before. We could go to a bigger city someplace else. No doubt we can have a church of 300, 400 people. I believe that with all my heart. I'm not just saying that. I believe that. But I believe that God has us here. I mean, it should be filled. It should be packed out. I'd love to see that. But, but God has us here because God has a job for us. And the Lord is saying nobody else is going to do it, Mark. They all want to either do nothing or they're leaving out of here. But I need somebody to reach these kids. I need somebody to do inner city work for me. There must have been a reason when I first got saved that God put into my heart to go into the inner city of Baton Rouge by myself out there and to pass out tracts and talk to people about Jesus. There must have been something that God was doing way back then when I first got saved. God says, I want you to reach these people. we got something better than Fred's, although Fred's may taste better, but I'm telling you, taste and see the Lord is good. He's good. Amen. I think I, I, I differ. I beg to differ. I think that his God is the best. Amen. God is the best. He satisfies. Can we stand together here tonight? Amen. Just come up here in the front with me, if you will. Let's pray together tonight. Just come stand up here with us. Praise the Lord. Maybe this message is for you. Maybe not. I don't know. The Word of God is good. And I pray that God ministered to you, that God has spoken to you, that you are encouraged tonight. I pray that you'll be strengthened, that there is hope tonight now. You're not alone. 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 Hallelujah. Let's trust the Lord tonight. It could be that we're looking the wrong direction. Maybe God wants you to look up. Maybe we're looking down, but God wants you to look up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have animosity against somebody else, then, then, then uh, I pray that you'll work that out fast. Don't let the sun go down on your angry man. I pray you don't have animosity against your pastor because that's real bad. That's real bad. Because that, that tells me there's some serious issues there. But I pray that we'll humble ourselves to the Lord, that we'll yield ourselves to God. I tell people, I say, if you think you can do it better, you know it better, you can teach it better, preach it better, then I'll, I'll encourage you to start your own church. Go ahead and do it. Because I'm telling you, through the years, I've seen people that always try to nitpick and find fault in me or the church or what we're doing here. I've seen it over and over and over. But let me tell you what that stems from. An evil heart of unbelief. I promise you. I promise you. I've seen it every time. And I try to stop it. Seems like Satan hands them by the nap of the collar or the neck, whatever you want to call it, and just don't let it happen to you. Don't give up. Don't give in. Trust God through it all. Let's sing this song together tonight. Worship the Lord. And just be our hearts to be filled with God tonight. His presence. God, keep me humble. Keep me broken. Strengthen my brothers and my sisters. I pray in the name of the Lord. Strengthen them. Help them. Help them, God. They're just trying to live their life for you. They're just trying to serve God. Help them, Lord, I pray. I pray that you would just fill them with the Holy Ghost. Speak to them as they spend time in prayer and meditation in the Word. Speak to them, God. Strengthen them, Lord God. Help them, Lord God. Pour out of heaven upon them. Supernaturally, Lord, I pray. God, I'm asking you to give a courage, a strength, a stability that only comes from the Lord. Help us to look up, not look down. Help our hearts not to become filled with unbelief. Oh God, like the children of Israel did, 40 years dying out in the wilderness. I pray, God, that if our arms are asleep, our legs are asleep, that it will wake up. I pray that our spiritual senses and vitality would be renewed and revived and be alert and awake. God, I'm asking in the name of the Lord that you would do something wonderful with this church. Do something wonderful with these people. Help them, Lord, I pray. Help us not to become too busy when we don't have time to sit at the feet of Jesus. I'm asking in the name of the Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand of what your word says, not just what we think is best, but what your word says. It scares me, Lord, because we have to yield ourselves to what the Bible says. God, help us. Help us. Help us. 
church, be encouraged tonight. My brothers and my sisters, be renewed tonight. Be strengthened tonight. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Trust Him by faith. Make Him your best friend. Make Him your all in all. Hallelujah. Praise God. Abby, would you sing that song? If you can, can you sing it tonight? If you need it. Terry and Izzy to come help you sing it tonight. Come on. Come on up here. Help them sing it. Where's Sister Terry at? Come help her sing this. Amen. Hallelujah. Sing this song together tonight. Worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Love the Lord and praise and worship Him. Hallelujah. Can you put that up there, the song up there? Anointing in the sanctuary. There is a stillness. Hallelujah. In the atmosphere. Oh, hallelujah. Praise and worship Him. Oh, come lay down. Oh, come lay down. The burden to. Come lay down 
would you do that right now? By faith, would you just take it and say, Jesus, I've been carrying this load too much. And I've been carrying it too long. And I've been trying to carry it by myself. So, God, I give it to you right now. And help me, Lord, by the grace of God, not to pick it back up, not to worry, not to fret. God, I can't add not one inch to my height by worrying about anything. But help me, God, to trust you. To bring my prayer, my supplication to you. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard my heart and my mind through Christ Jesus. I pray right now, Father. Lord, by faith, my brothers and my sisters in Christ, would you take it to the Lord by faith? Take it to God by faith. Bring it to Him right now. Not to be picked back up. I give it to the Lord. I give it to Jesus. I give it to Jesus. I give it to Jesus. By faith, I give it to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. tells us and I promise you that God will do this work because he cannot go back on his word his word sometimes in prayer you can open up to the Psalms and begin to read the Psalms just begin to read the Psalms and the Lord hallelujah you can pray the Psalms and worship in the Psalms and in that you'll learn the heart of God heart of the Lord there's so much more it's like there's this treasure chest and it's got about a few coins on the top of it and and we're fighting over the coins on the top of the treasure chest and I'm telling you I'm saying if you'll open it up there's a whole lot more in there than just a few coins on the top and I think we're just touching the surface and we're just wrestling and fighting over the coins When there's a whole treasure of God and blessing and presence and spirit. Praise God. Psalm 25. Oh Lord, you are my God. I will extol you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things. You can pray that. You can take your Bible and pray that. The Lord will help you. Yes, the Lord will strengthen you. Amen. Be encouraged tonight. Be blessed tonight don't try to carry it all on your own don't try to do it all yourself but learn to trust the Lord with it and learn to take it to Jesus amen therefore don't give up don't give in don't grow weary and well doing keep a right heart and right attitude and if your heart isn't right you know it Take it to the Lord. Say, God, my heart isn't right. Now, God, change it. Change it. Change my heart. I've had to do that many times. But see, that keeps us from having a hardened heart of unbelief. Amen. You know, as I quit, I'm quitting. I quit three times already, but I quit again. But it's okay to admit your faults to the Lord. It's okay to... Confess your faults and your sins before the Lord. We're living in a time where people don't want to admit that they're wrong, but I'm telling you that 
A broken and contrite heart is one that admits they messed up, admits that they made mistakes, that admits that they need the Lord and it humbles themselves and even goes to people and apologizes. Amen. That wonderful. Praise God. It's a good day today. Yes, ma'am, you may. Yes. Changing my last name to McCuricombe. <laughs> Pastor McCuricombe. <laughs> we think. <laughs> I like that. Initials stay the same. Pastor McCuricombe. <laughs> you know, you're right, sister. My mama, she'd say, This is going to sting a little bit. She put that McCuricombe on, then she'd blow on it. I say, Mom, it hurts worse when you quit blowing. I say, Quit blowing. <laughs> Leave it alone. Amen. But but that's what we needed or we'd get an infection. That's what we needed to help us. Amen. Praise God. Well, y'all wonderful today. Y'all be careful this week. Uh, we have prayer at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. Did I mention that tonight? I might have forgotten. We have prayer 7 o'clock this Tuesday. Please come. Please come. Let's, let's pray together. Wednesday we have our midweek service. Be blessed this week. Be careful. Amen. Tell somebody you love them in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.